So I'm going to speak about innovative corrective surgical techniques in pediatric lower de limb deformities. Um, there are so many uh, new techniques and I wanted to narrow these to a handful that I've been involved in developing over the last uh, many years. We're going to start with the super hip procedure for congenital femoral deficiency. So this is used, as you know, for what we call type 1B, where you have a delayed ossification of the femoral neck. And in this situation, it's very hard to correct the very complex deformities of the femoral neck where you have flexion, you have varus, you have rotation, all involved with soft tissue contractures of flexion and abduction and external rotation of the hip. And how do we correct it into a nice uh, hypoplastic, normal looking femur like this? So we do this by lateral approach, taking down the uh, contracted uh, fascia lata iliotibial band, exposing the muscles. We uh, also do a lengthening of the rectus femoris tendon, the, the psoas tendon. We split the apophysis, which therefore lengthens or does what we call an abductor muscle slide, an iliacus muscle slide. And we also cut the piriformis tendon. These are all part of the soft tissue releases. We then expose the femur by elevating the quadriceps muscle and then we can start the bony work. It's important to place our guide wires, tip of trochanter to center femoral head, and then 45 degrees to that is the definition of where the location of the femoral neck should be. It's difficult to see the femoral neck because it is non-ossified. And using an arthrogram, we can see centering on the lateral view, the ossific nucleus, um, the uh, neck and the head, and then we want to make sure our guide wires into the center of the femoral head. We use a cannulated chisel uh, to go up the femoral neck. Uh, I find the instrumentation of orthopediatrics particularly useful for this uh, operation uh, for the very small children using the infant blade plate set. And important that the blade plate, the chisel, be perpendicular to the uh, back of the greater trochanter in order to uh, have it in the correct orientation for flexion and extension. So in the end, your plate is oriented relative to the shaft of the femur uh, so that it is correct to the proximal femur. And we then need to match the distal femur to that location. It is a 130 degree blade plate because that will be the normal neck shaft angle. We then make a osteotomy perpendicular and parallel to this and complete the osteotomy of the femur. And then we can dislocate the bone fragments and overlap them in a bayonet fashion and then shorten the uh, femur uh, in order to accommodate the tightness of the associated soft tissues. The shortening is a very important element of this treatment. We are also correcting the varus, the flexion, and the external rotation at the same time. You can see we've already performed a uh, uh, iliac osteotomy, a dega type osteotomy. And with this opening wedge here, we use that bone graft that we just shortened in order to support that opening wedge. Uh, we complete the fixation with our screws. And then in these non-ossified necks, the only way to, I've, I've found to get them ossified is to insert bone morphogenic protein into the femoral neck. I know this is something that in Italy um, you may not be able to do, uh, but um, without the BMP in these non-ossified necks, uh, they frequently do not ossify. And because we have lengthened the abductor muscles by bringing down the greater trochanter because of our opening wedge osteotomy and the varus correction, uh, we have to shorten the iliac wing uh, to do what we call an abductor muscle slide. And that's critical to be able to get the full correction. Examples of this, you can see here with this non-ossified femoral neck, this is a type 1B, and you can uh, see after the correction, uh, looks fully corrected, but there's no neck. But because of the BMP, the BMP leads to ossification of the superior part of the femoral neck. And you can see where no BMP was placed, there is no ossification. And eventually this will fully ossify. Another example, you see the MRI showing the, the uh, cartilaginous femoral neck. So the MRI is very useful in the classification in determining if you have a true cartilaginous femoral neck. 
And in this case, we did the super hip procedure and she fully ossified her femoral neck. And then at a later date, we lengthened her femur with a monolateral uh, external fixator articulated across the knee joint. And then you can see um, at the end of the eight centimeters of lengthening that we did in her. Um, as a second lengthening, we used an implantable lengthening technique at the age of eight. And we did four centimeters of lengthening. And then we repeated that with a contralateral epiphysiodesis. And this completed her lengthening. So she became equal leg length at the end of these procedures that I've shown you. And this is the final result when she is skeletally mature, equal leg length, employing total of 16 centimeters of lengthening and epiphysiodesis for five centimeters. The super knee procedure is a complementary procedure to this and is very useful when you have instability of the knee, such as from congenital femoral deficiency. And in this case, we start by harvesting the uh, iliotibial band. If we are already doing a super hip, we continue on at the end of the super hip with the harvested iliotibial band and we convert it to two ligaments, the posterior one that we are turning into a tube and the other one is flat. We do a notch plasty because these children have no notch. And then we make a drill hole only in the epiphysis, avoiding any injury to the physis. And we go also on the medial side, this is a medial incision, find the adductor magnus and we take half of the fascia lata, go under the skin around this um, fulcrum of the adductor magnus, and I call this the reverse Macintosh. And on the lateral side, we go under the lateral collateral ligament, over the intramuscular septum, under the periosteum, and through our drill hole to come out to the front. And this is anchored with a biotin adhesis screw. And we finally pass this underneath and tie them together. So this is uh, to stabilize the knee in a lot of these patients. I even did this in a 24 year old woman, as you can see here, who needed a super hip and the super knee procedure. You can see the rotatory subluxation of the tibia on the femur. You cannot lengthen in this situation. So you have to reconstruct these procedures. And so here we have the super hip, the super knee, all in one uh, treatment. Super ankle procedure is used for fibular hemimelia. Knees, we have a fixed equinovalgus deformity. And after the treatment with a supramalleolar and a subtalar osteotomy of the malunited coalition, we have complete realignment. Uh, this starts with uh, uh, resection of the, uh, of the fibrous and the cartilaginous onlage of the fibula. And then we do a uh, subtalar coalition osteotomy. We pin the ankle to prevent the correction going through the joint. And then we do a supramalleolar osteotomy, keeping the periosteum here intact for vascularization, displace the supramalleolar osteotomy, and then shorten the tibia. But before we shorten, we lengthen by doing the subtalar osteotomy, adding length to the height of the foot, and this further shortens. So by dislo dislocating the bone ends, we allow this to move. We then shorten the tibia, reduce the shortening, and then pin this again. Shortening is a key element of a lot of these uh, very complex deformity corrections where we are gaining length. So here's an example of severe equina valgus in this child, and then after the correction, and then we also place a frame uh, to lengthen the leg. My preferred frame uh, currently is the one that I developed, which is the Orthex uh, frame, which orthopediatrics uses. And we can then lengthen and realign the leg. Um, here's an example of a similar case. We did the super ankle at 18 months with lengthening as the subsequent treatment. And then uh, three years later, she has uh, a little bit of a cosin phenomenon with valgus at the knee, a little bit of recurrent equinus. And so three years later, I wanted to lengthen her. And we put on the, this uh, lengthening plate, the precise plate, and lengthened her with a plate. This is what's coming in the future. So the ability to lengthen not only with external fixation, but we did a supramalleolar osteotomy here and an osteotomy for correction of the valgus. And we fixed it all with the plate, the precise plate and lengthened this simultaneously. So I thought this would fit into the theme of innovative surgical solutions. 
Um, patellar arthroplasty for tibial hem hem hemimilia will be my last case. And this is really, you know, in the trilogy of the hemimilias and CFD, um, this is the hardest and most difficult pathology. <clears throat> it is primarily treated in most countries by amputation through the knee. But if there is a patella, we have a very good solution for this. And we, we can do a patellar arthroplasty for the knee. I combine this with distraction. So I do an Achilles tenotomy. I protect the fibula from ep uh, epiphyseolysis by doing a temporary epiphyseodesis with these wires. We then place the frame um, onto the femur, fibula, and foot. And then we gradually distract to centralize the fibula. We gradually distract to centralize the foot on the fibula. This takes many months. My preferred frame is again, the one I developed with or, um, called Orthex, which Orthopediatrics currently has. The advantage is it has these Z plates and these Z plates allow you to create very large angulations, double telescopic struts, so you don't have to change the struts very often. And the ability to uh, use the software, which can co correct deformities even greater than 90 degrees. There is actually no other apparatus that can uh, achieve these kind of extreme corrections. So it's very, very helpful in this situation. And here's an example on a tibial hemimelia child. You can see with these Z plates in the back, the Z plates in the front, severe greater than 90 degree correction at the, at the knee and, and then a large correction at the foot. And this is at the end of the distraction. Um, we then do the patellar arthroplasty. This was originally described by Weber and I've modified this technique and uh, published it in JPO, uh, JCO. And um, you can see we create these visor flaps uh, we are going to take the, the patella on its vascular pedicle and flip it downwards and attach it to the top of the um, uh, ossific nucleus of the fibula. And at the ankle, we're going to fuse the ankle by re removing the surfaces. Because we have pre-distracted, the surfaces are near each other and it's very easy to do this fusion, this reduction, and then to join the patella to the fibula. What I found helps in these cartilaginous patellas to put some bone morphogenic protein inside. This leads to ossification of the cartilage and uh, leads to union between the patella and the fibula. And this, you can see here is the final patella arthroplasty. This fits perfectly in a congruous fashion with the surface of the femur. And then you do your capsular repair. And you put on a frame with a hinge so the patient can bend the knee and it protects the knee uh, for while the ankle fusion is being completed. Now, this is what it looks like when you're finished. I'll show you an example. This is a girl uh, type 5A using my classification or what you would know as a Jones 1. But the 5A refers to the fact that you not only are missing the tibia, but you also have a patella present. And therefore, um, you can do this procedure. So uh, consideration for patella is very important. Here is after already the distraction and converting to an articulated frame. And I wanna show you, this is uh, 14, 15 years later. This is what the knee looks like. Looks like an incredible, perfect knee. It's very stable. I leave a fragment of patella. When I take the patella, I don't take it all. And therefore they have a new patella in place here. Okay, and so she has active motion of the knee. And this is my final slide to show you what her function is. Here she is at the age of 14 uh, with a tibial hemimelia treated with the and Paley Weber patellar arthroplasty. So a little bit of science fiction fascination. What can we do? Look how far we've come in the uh, last 30 years since I started uh, in this field. Uh, it's unbelievable uh, what we're able to do now. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias por su atención.